Hello, welcome to today's lecture by Dr. Gabby Barbare. I'm Dennis Hanasak, research professor here at Harbor Branch and host of the series. Now, as most of you know, back in November, due to the pandemic, we, be we, we began delivering the Ocean Science Lecture Series in a virtual format, as so many other events were done throughout the world. I'm glad we did that and that we could continue to share what we do at Harbor Branch with you as our work went on despite COVID. In fact, our research act efforts actually grew. Uh, we all learned a lot about the pros and cons of virtual lectures. Um, we actually did more virtual lectures than we originally planned to do. We had more interesting things to share with you. And we had a great attentive audi audience who always asks great questions and engages our speakers well. So this is gonna be our last scheduled virtual ocean science lecture. We plan to go in hiatus as we do most years this time of the year. So we will de-zoom, if you will, and resume in January for in-person lectures as we have done in the pre-pandemic past. For those of you who can attend in person, please do. It'll be great to see you all here at Harbor Branch. Uh, for those of you who cannot attend, we will stream our lectures as we have also done in the past. So today's speaker is uh, Dr. G Gabby Barbarite. Gabby came to Harbor Branch as an undergraduate in 2008 to participate in the Semester by the Sea program and then our summer internship programs. And so here we are 13 years later, Gabby never left. Now she's not the only one in the group today who seems to have been here a long time. Um, Gabby went on to pursue a PhD in marine microbial ecology with Dr. Peter McCarthy here at Harbor Branch. Her dissertation research focused on the occurrence of pathogenic Vibrio bacteria in local waters and their potential hazard to the recreational community. Her work established an important monitoring baseline for the region and received a great deal of public attention. And during this project, she realized her passion for science communication. And she made that a priority to share her findings with health departments and medical practitioners and water managers and media agencies and school groups and community members. So Gabby did graduate, but did I say she never left? And that's because she made such a good impression with her PhD work and her interest in scientific communication. And she uh, quickly became uh, now our director of outreach and engagement here at Harbor Branch. And she oversees our Mission Ocean Discovery outreach programs, which includes um, opportunities for the community to connect with and learn from marine science experts through exhibitions, tours, lecture series, uh, citizen science activities, after school programs, and more. And her lecture today is really the unveiling of a behind the scenes look at one of our cutting edge research projects, our IMTA project. And uh, the lecture today will conclude with a question and answer session with several of our Harbor Branch science scientists involved with this project. So it's great to have Gabby back this time on our virtual podium here. Um, and she's going to speak on exploring the integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system at FAU Harbor Branch. Gabby. Thank you, Dennis, for the great introduction and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. I'm excited to present alongside this great group of researchers and to share some more on this exciting project that we've been working on. So let me go ahead and start by sharing my screen. All right, great, so let's dive in. So before we get into today's topic, I wanted to start by giving an overview of outreach here at FAU Harbor Branch. So like Dennis mentioned, I oversee our Mission Ocean Discovery Outreach Programs, which provide opportunities for the community to learn from and connect with our experts. And uh, we have a lot of great programs. In fact, you are participating in one now, our Ocean Science Lecture Series. Uh, but we also have a great visitor center that has research themed exhibitions uh, and aquariums. And I'm excited to report that we're finishing up some building renovations and we'll be reopening the center in September. And so you'll definitely have to come and check us out. We have a lot of uh, neat new displays that we'll be showcasing. And at that point, we'll also be starting up daily campus tours. Uh, so you can come and take a behind the scenes look at our facility here in Fort Pierce, Florida, and learn a little bit more about our history and the research that's underway here. 
And this winter, we'll be resuming our very popular uh, boat tours, which is an awesome opportunity to get out on the Indian River Lagoon, see some local wildlife, and learn from our outreach scientists. So there's lots to see and do here at FAU Harbor Branch. And we also take our message into the community uh, through things like presentations with our Speakers Bureau program, uh, exhibitions at festivals, and even after school programs in partnership with our good friends at the Boys and Girls Club of St. Lucie County. And this year, our team really worked to expand our online offerings and created an array of virtual resources for ocean lovers of all ages. And you can find those resources as well as information on all of these programs on our website. Uh, and collectively, our Mission Ocean Discovery programs engage about 40,000 people a year. So they're very successful uh, and impactful programs. So in addition to our regular offerings, my team also works very closely with our scientists and engineers to provide outreach components on research grants. And this is very important. And in fact, a lot of funding agencies require that uh, researchers include something called broader impacts in their proposals. So basically they want to see a plan that you're going to be sharing your science that you do uh, with broader audiences. And so um, this was always one of my favorite things to do when I was a, a scientist. And I have a favorite saying that says, science isn't completed until it's shared. And so I love working closely with our researchers. And of course, we're making amazing discoveries here all the time. And these discoveries uh, directly impact our daily lives. And so today I'm going to be telling you about some of the outreach that I've been working on with our aquaculture research group over the last few years. So aquaculture is the growing of aquatic plants and animals for food and for restoration. And about half of the seafood that we eat comes from aquaculture. However, only about 1% of these products are actually produced in the United States. And so it's very important that we come up with ways to improve the sustainable production of seafood, not only for our economy, but also to wisely use our ocean resources. And so one of the projects here that our researchers are working on is called the Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture System, or IMTA. And this project is funded by the Florida Aquaculture Specialty License Plate. And since the project began in 2011, uh, over half of the researchers here at Harbor Branch have contributed to it in some way or another. So it's a very collaborative project, which I think is really cool. Uh, and here on the slide, you can see a picture of the dedicated space to the INTA in our aquaculture research and development park. So there's a large building here that contains some tanks as well as this field outside. And the IMTA is a closed recirculating system and the cool thing about it is that it functions a lot like an ecosystem. And so we can grow all of these different organisms and each has a specific role in the system and can be used for different purposes. And you'll learn more about that in just a few minutes. So we've been working to do outreach with uh, the IMTA group for a couple of years now. And our first uh, objective was to create an educational display or basically a mini IMTA at our Ocean Discovery Visitor Center. And you can see a picture of it here. Uh, it's just under a thousand gallons of salt water and it includes some tanks some troughs as well as the filtration and then some signs along the back that describe the IMTA project, how the system works and a little bit more about the different plants and animals that are inside of it and why they're so important. And I have to say this just has been one of our most popular displays. People love to come and look at uh, all the different things that we're growing. And of course, this large window provides a great opportunity to peek down and look at some of the fish. We're currently culturing uh, red drum. Uh, but then it also works as a great educational tool because we can show how the water flows through the system into some of the different plants uh, to fertilize those. And then down into this lower trough here that contains uh, macroalgae and invertebrates, which also functions as a cool little touch tank. So, a really great display and since we installed it, it has been viewed by over 15,000 visitors. Uh, and you can see of all ages and backgrounds. Um, so we've been able to really share this research with um, the broader community. So to expand upon these efforts, uh, last year we decided 
that we wanted to create a virtual tour of the aquaculture system, uh, of the IMTA system. And this was led by one of our outreach scientists, Brandon McHenry, and he took video of the system and also uh, some of our researchers and you'll get to see that in just a few minutes. We're gonna play it now. Uh, and then also our second objective was to develop an associated high school curriculum to accompany the video. And uh, following this lecture, we will be posting the video uh, and the curriculum on our website and it will all be open access to anyone that wants to see it. And we hope that teachers will also be able to uh, include it in their classrooms and inspire the next generation of aquaculture researchers. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to play the video. It's about a half an hour. And then uh, when it's done, we'll be bringing on a panel of some of the researchers that work on the IMTA project so you can ask us your questions. So while you're watching the video, if anything pops into your minds, go ahead and type it into the chat and uh, we will be back to talk some more about this project. Hello everyone and welcome to Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. My name is Brandon McHenry and today we're going to take an exclusive behind the scenes look at some of the sustainable aquaculture research that is underway here. On your tour you will get to look inside some of the research buildings, see the many different species being grown, and even hear about our latest discoveries directly from the scientists who made them. Let's start with a quick introduction on the seafood industry and the importance of aquaculture. Seafood is a widely popular, highly nutritious source of protein that contains important vitamins, minerals, and omega fatty acids. Because of its many health benefits, seafood serves as a staple in the diet of many populations around the world, from subsistence harvesting to multi-billion dollar culinary industries. Over the last 50 years, seafood consumption around the world has doubled with over 340 billion pounds of seafood eaten annually. That's approximately 40 pounds per person. In order to keep up with this growing demand and take fishing pressures off the oceans, seafood suppliers are making use of aquacultured products. Half of the world's seafood comes from the aquaculture industry and it employs over 20 million people around the globe. Aquaculture is the growing of aquatic plants and animals in captive systems for food, cosmetics, aquariums, biofuels, and more. This industry uses multiple culturing methods including offshore net pens, inshore ponds, raceways, and closed recirculating systems. Growing by about 8% each year, the aquaculture industry is the fastest growing sector of agriculture. Today, over 580 species are grown in the aquaculture industry, including finfish, mollusks like clams and oysters, crustaceans such as shrimp, other animals like sea urchins, as well as marine algae or seaweeds. Here at FAU Harbor Branch, we have been leading the way in advancing aquaculture in Florida, the United States and internationally for over four decades. Our researchers focus on the sustainable production of safe, high quality domestic seafood, system design and engineering, as well as improving the health and nutritional value of farm raised products. We also work towards advancing culturing techniques for species that will benefit seafood industries as well as restoration efforts, transferring technology to the private sector, and providing training to the workforce with a goal of supporting healthy economies and ecosystems worldwide. FAU Harbor Branch has a multidisciplinary aquaculture team comprised of fish culturists, nutritionists, physiologists, microbiologists, geneticists, mathematicians, and engineers who work together to benefit this growing industry. Our scientists collaborate with academia, government agencies, private industries, nonprofit institutions, and foundations in order to research and develop innovative solutions to sustainably feed the world. In 2011, our researchers began developing a land-based integrated multitrophic aquaculture system, or IMTA. Since then, the system has served as a valuable platform for aquaculture experimentation 
and is a model for sustainable seafood production. Before we head over to our aquaculture park to see the full-scale IMTA system, I'm going to walk you through our display here at the Ocean Discovery Visitor Center to show you the concepts behind the system. The IMTA is a recirculating aquaculture system, meaning it filters, cleans, and recycles water through all of the tanks. It is a saltwater system, so it can be used to grow several marine plants and animals, each representing a different trophic level, or position, on the food web. This ecosystem approach is an improvement upon traditional recirculating aquaculture systems because it effectively converts wastes into resources that can then be used to produce additional crops. Our IMTA display is one continuous loop. The process begins with wastewater from our fish, which gets sent to the biofilter, then to fertilize the plants growing in this top trough, and the algae growing below. These crops can be used for food for the various invertebrates being grown in the system, as well as people. After that, the water flows right back to the original tank to start the process all over again. It is the relationship between these different plant and animal species and the way that they're grown that makes the IMTA system one of the hallmark advancements of the FAU Harbor Branch Aquaculture Group. So with these concepts in mind, let's head over to campus. This photo shows an aerial view of the FAU Harbor Branch campus. On the right, you can see our 30-acre aquaculture development park. This area contains over 39,000 square feet of state-of-the-art hatcheries, nurseries, grow-out systems, laboratories, and classrooms. With a goal of leading by example, these facilities were built with sustainability in mind using land-based recirculation technology that will not only minimize water use, but also efficiently manage power consumption and waste production. This section of the aquaculture park is dedicated research space for the integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system. Before we go inside, let's take a look at how the system works. So like I showed you earlier, the IMTA system was designed to function like an ecosystem. Here, you can see some of the different plants and animals our researchers are growing. Another unique feature is that this system is fully modular and consists of many different loops, all connected to one central filtration system. This means that we can not only change out the species that we culture, but we can even add new ones at any time by simply adding an additional loop. Now, let's go inside the building that serves as the main hub for the IMTA system. On top of this platform are several large rectangular tanks, each housing different animals that our researchers are studying. You can also see some of the filtration and plumbing that we'll talk about later. The first stop on our tour is the control panel for the system. Here, we can see all of the different water quality parameters being measured throughout the many tanks in the system, all displayed on the screen. We also have complete control over the system's function, which allows us to manipulate the flow through the different loops and decide how much water, as well as nutrients, the different plants and animals receive. This panel can be programmed to control equipment and automatically perform tasks, like cleaning the filters, to help make maintaining the system easier. Our current research skill MTA system has helped scientists to learn some of the fundamentals of such operation. However, to scale a research MTA system up to a commercial farm adds some additional challenges. One area in particular is to reduce the labor intensity of maintaining the farm. One exciting project we are working on is investigating the application of artificial intelligence or AI in MTA system. For example, the novel algae biomass sensor we're developing will help to reduce the human involvement in measuring this critical parameter of the IMTA system. Currently, the IMTA system consists of over 16,000 gallons of seawater and houses 14 different marine species across 28 different tanks located both inside and outside of this research building. Now, Let's take a look at some of the different plants and animals being grown by our researchers, as well as the roles that they play and their value to the industry. 
One of the first things that people think about when they hear seafood are fish. Over the years, our researchers have grown several different species of marine fish in the IMTA system. The first is Florida pompano, which is becoming a popular choice for aquaculture farms and is highly valued as one of the most sought after food fish. Next is cobia, which is thought to be one of the most suitable candidates for warm water aquaculture and demands high prices at restaurants because of its excellent flavor. Red drum, more commonly referred to as redfish, are currently being cultured in our IMTA system. These fish are found throughout the Atlantic and Gulf Coast regions and get their name from the rusty red color of their scales and the drumming sound they make when they communicate underwater. Red drum are a popular recreational species that are sought after for both sport and food. Because it is a protected game fish, the only reliable way to source red drum for consumption is through aquaculture. We have over 700 red drum being grown in this 3,000 gallon circular tank. These animals are referred to as the fed culture, which means they receive food from outside of the system, like these pellets. After the fish have eaten, the waste they produce provides necessary nutrients that are used to grow additional crops within the system, increasing the overall potential for farmers to profit. One of the interesting things we found about growing fish in the IMTA system is that they taste more like fish from the wild. Sometimes, fish grown in standard recirculating systems can be a little bit off flavor and need more time to purge in new water before being eaten. The fish from the IMTA don't need this extra step, which will save time and money for farmers. Now, the water containing waste from the fish leaves the tank. It then travels down this pipe, which runs along the floor underneath some of the other equipment, then back up until it reaches the first component of the filtration, the solids filter. Here, the large chunks of leftover fish food and fish waste are removed and concentrated. From there, they are sent to a secondary storage vessel where they are transformed into bioflock. Bioflock are small aggregations of solid materials, bacteria, algae, and other microscopic organisms, like this worm. It is also very rich in nutrients and is a valuable resource that can be used to feed other species within the system. Once created, the bioflock is kept alive in a large tank with constant aeration. After the solids are removed, the water is sent to the next stage of the filtration, the biofilter. Here, nitrifying bacteria break down dissolved compounds from the fish waste and begin the nutrient cycle. In order to grow enough bacteria to process the waste produced by all these fish, the IMTA system uses large, specialized filters that house millions of plastic pinwheels. These pinwheels tumble continuously and provide surfaces for beneficial microbes to grow on so that they can help clean the water. While they can't be seen with the naked eye, bacteria are actually the most abundant organisms in this system, and they play a vital role in maintaining a functioning aquaculture operation. Our researchers study the types of microbes present in the IMTA system, as well as the areas that they occupy. The water circulating through the IMTA contains thousands of species of bacteria and other microbes, many of which play important roles in the health of the system. Even though the water circulates through the entire system, the microbial community varies depending upon the food sources and the amount of oxygen and light which are present. My research studies how these communities change, how they can affect the quality of products such as the fish which come out of the system, and the identification of potential problems that need to be remedied. From there, the water then heads to the main sump. This compartment is where all of the water collects for the entire system. At any given time, there are approximately 100 gallons per minute entering and leaving the sump from the IMTA system's many components. Pumps, like the one you see here, distribute water from the sump to the designated plants and animals in the system. After leaving the sump, the water then travels through these pipes, along the ceiling, 
and through a device called a heat exchanger. This ensures that the water entering and leaving the building remains a consistent temperature. Finally, the water heads outside. Unlike most traditional systems that discharge and replace water to remove excess nutrients, the IMTA system uses marine plants that will absorb them instead. Marsh plants, typically found along the banks of coastal estuaries, are unique because they've evolved to tolerate seawater and have developed ways to rid themselves of excess salt. This adaptation makes them great candidates for farms with saltwater systems. These marsh plants are grown in outdoor troughs where they can use sunlight to grow and remove excess nutrients from the water in the IMTA system. Researchers are conducting experiments to determine the best practices for cultivating these marine plants, which are new to the aquaculture industry. We have found three different species of edible halophyte plants that can be grown successfully in the IMTA system. These species are sea asparagus, sea purslane, and saltwort. They're native to Florida coastal areas and are found along other coastal areas worldwide. Our studies have shown that these salt-loving plants prefer to be grown in a sandy substrate. It takes about 10 weeks until they're ready to harvest and approximately 75% of the plant is edible. Several types of marine marsh plants are currently being grown in the IMTA system. Sea asparagus, also known as sea beans, are edible marsh plants that are commonly used to complement salads and many fish dishes. Next is sea purslane, another edible marsh plant that is often pickled and used in many traditional condiments in cultures around the world. Our final marsh plant is saltwort which grows on tidal flats and can be used in salads, seasonings, purees, and even natural remedies. Understanding the nutritional value of these marsh plants is a key component to the expansion of their market in the U.S. These halophyte plants, also known as sea vegetables, are a great addition to any entree and are highly prized worldwide. From our nutritional investigations, we have found that they are low in caloric value, fat-free, and provide a natural source of protein, fiber, iodine, along with many minerals and vitamins. We are excited about the potential of these cultured plants to be a natural food supplement as a new plant-based addition for a healthy diet and for integration into a variety of cuisines. Red mangroves can be found in coastal ecosystems around the world. Our researchers are growing these protected trees to help areas that have been impacted by urban development and to restore critical habitat for thousands of organisms. Adult mangrove trees drop these large seeds, called propagules, which we can grow and then pass off to our partners so that they can be used in shoreline restoration projects across Florida. The IMTA system also cultures macroalgae, or seaweeds, which help to filter the water. This green seaweed is called ulva, or sea lettuce. Sea lettuce forms thin, translucent sheets and can be eaten raw, dried, or cooked, and is frequently used in both soups and salads. The algae are grown in large outdoor troughs and constantly tumbled by aeration to ensure that it all receives an equal amount of sunlight throughout the day. This allows the entire culture to grow evenly, which increases the overall productivity and nutrient removal. As in nature, energy flows through our IMTA system and nutrients are recycled. Rather than discharging the waste from all of our IMTA fish and invertebrates into the natural environment, our seaweed uses those waste and energy from sunlight to make new life, as only plants can do. Understanding these processes is critical to making our aquaculture at FAU Harbor Branch environmentally friendly and sustainable. This seaweed grows so rapidly that our researchers can harvest approximately half of the culture every week. Because they contain important dietary supplements, these algae can be repurposed into food for a variety of animals, further increasing the self-sustainability of the IMTA system. Next, the water is sent back to the sump, where it is then redirected to these long tanks used for growing invertebrates, or 
animals that lack a backbone. Over the last 10 years, the IMTA system has been home to many different invertebrates that all act as a natural cleanup crew, consuming excess waste, algae, and other suspended organic material. These animals serve an important role in keeping the IMTA system clean and functional. First, we have the sea sponges. These animals filter thousands of gallons of seawater per day to capture dissolved organic material and microorganisms, like bacteria. Due to the rich microbial diversity of sea sponges and the vast array of chemicals they produce, our researchers are studying these animals and their ability to create new life-saving antibiotics and anti-cancer treatments. These sponges can also be used in reef restoration projects across Florida. Because sponges filter large volumes of water and can remove both dissolved and particulate nutrients, they're an obvious choice for integration into a multi-trophic aquaculture system. We're using the IMTA for two applications. First, to create sufficient biomass of sponges that produce bioactive chemicals, and second, to use the IMTA as a nursery to grow sponges large enough to transplant to habitats where sponge die-offs have occurred as a result of harmful algal blooms or severe weather events like hurricanes. Our group at FAU Harbor Branch has recently made a breakthrough discovery, enabling us to grow sponges much more quickly than they grow in the wild. We hypothesize that we can grow thousands of sponges using an ecologically sustainable approach. Oysters and clams are other filter feeders that have been grown in the IMTA system. These animals consume suspended solids and microalgae, which helps to keep the water clear. Oysters and clams are popular food items and are a profitable, dual-purpose crop to grow in aquaculture. The clams and oysters that you eat are almost entirely produced through aquaculture. Clams and oysters are raised on both of Florida's coast and they're a huge part of the Florida aquaculture industry. As a matter of fact, clams are the number two produced aquaculture product in Florida. We've done a lot of different studies with clams and oysters in the IMTA system. One of the current studies we're working on are dietary studies. We're looking at two different clam species, the hard clam, which you are familiar with in the supermarket, as well as a sunray venus clam. And we are feeding them different species of microalgae, different combinations of that to look at how that increases growth, survival, and development in young clams. This study can then be used to inform clam hatcheries as to ways that they can increase clam production simply by changing a clam's diet. Next, we have the sea urchins which are relatives to sea stars, sand dollars, and sea cucumbers. These invertebrates are covered in spines and clear suction-like tube feet, which they use to cling to the side of the tank and capture algae to eat. This animal's reproductive organs, referred to as uni, are edible and considered a delicacy around the world. Here we have the gray sea cucumber, which feeds on both suspended and settled solids, removing excess waste from the IMTA system. These animals are growing in popularity as a food item in many countries throughout South America and Asia. We've worked with other invertebrates as well, such as sea urchins and sea cucumbers. With the sea urchins, we have incorporated an IMTA-produced product, Ulva, which is a type of seaweed, to see how that increases uh, egg production, or uni. And for the sea cucumber, we have taken a look at incorporating Bioflock, a byproduct of uneaten feed and organic matter produced by the IMTA system into their diet to increase growth and survival. Next, we have a type of sea snail called the Florida fighting conch. These animals are also edible and are being investigated as a sustainable alternative to its overfished relative, the queen conch. The Florida and West Indian fighting conch are herbivores, also known as plant grazers. They live in the seagrass beds of Florida up to North Carolina and throughout the Caribbean. We first started growing these conch in aquaculture tanks at Harbor Branch in the early 2000s for the aquarium market. These conch grow well in captivity and may be a potential sustainable seafood product 
in the future. Finally, there are the Pacific White Shrimp. The shrimp in the IMTA system consume the nutrient-rich bioflock and help to prevent a buildup of excess waste products. These animals can grow to be almost 9 inches long and are one of the most popular types of seafood eaten around the world. Shrimp have been the number one consumed seafood in the American diet for more than a dozen years. The vast majority of shrimp are now produced by aquaculture and shrimp culture is a huge global industry. Due to the popularity of shrimp in the American diet, fisheries alone cannot supply demand. Therefore, by culturing shrimp, we make shrimp an affordable product and it also reduces the pressure on the amount of shrimp taken from the ocean, ensuring a stable wild population because other marine organisms like squid and octopi also enjoy a tasty shrimp dinner. A lot of the research we have conducted in the IMTA system with shrimp involve dietary studies. For instance, we've looked at incorporating seaweed and in shrimp diets, replacing fish meal, that's a hot topic in aquaculture. And we've also looked at the effect of adding additives like probiotics to the diet and seeing not only how that enhances growth and survival, but also increases resistance to diseases such as bacteria and viruses. Since 2011, the IMTA system has been a valuable platform for experimentation and advancing land-based aquaculture. These studies have provided a better understanding of important species that are native to Florida, as well as the techniques necessary to grow them in captivity. Along with experiments to learn to use the IMTA for aquaculture, the system itself is a wonderful platform for experimentation with how species live and interact with their environment. Some of our researchers are looking at how carbon dioxide affects the animals in the system, which could point to effects of excess carbon dioxide in the world's oceans and coastal waters. All in all, over half of the scientists at FAU Harbor Branch have contributed to the project in one form or another. This includes biologists who study fish, conch, sponges, and plants, to microbiologists and engineers. Our researchers strive to create sustainable systems and continue to investigate ways to improve by incorporating emerging technologies like renewable energy. Part of the energy required to run the IMTA system comes from solar power. We have two 1,000 square foot solar panels that take radiant energy from the sun and use it to help offset the cost of operating the IMTA system. By increasing the knowledge of various culturing techniques and system designs, researchers at FAU Harbor Branch are leading the way in culturing both environmentally and economically important species. Our goal is to transfer this new technology to the private sector so that full-scale commercial operations can adopt these techniques and keep costs low and profits high, while also remaining environmentally friendly and sustainable. For this reason, the IMTA project plays a key role in ensuring global food security for generations to come. Given the importance of seafood in our diets and the nearly complete exploitation of our natural fisheries, it is critically important that the United States improves and expands its domestic aquaculture production. At FAU Harbor Branch, we are committed to achieving this goal through innovative projects like the IMTA system. Developing and improving aquaculture technologies that benefit the United States aquaculture industry is a keystone part of our strategic plan. I hope you all enjoyed this behind the scenes tour. If you want to learn more about the IMTA system, you can stop by our Ocean Discovery Visitor Center or join us for one of our campus tours. The IMTA project and this video were funded by the Florida Aquaculture Specialty License Plate Program, which is administered by the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation. You can support this vital research by purchasing a plate online or from your local tax collector's office. For more information, please visit our website at www.fau.edu slash hboi.
All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed our virtual tour of the IMTA. Oh, Dennis, I saw you were back. There you are. <laughs> and I think at this point, we're going to bring on uh, a panel of some of our researchers who work on the IMTA project. Here they come. I think um, most everybody knows us uh, and you saw us in the video, but Gabby, do you want to give quick intros to everybody or we could self introduce, but I think you can probably just do it. Huh? It's your lecture. Questions. Megan, let's start with you. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Davis, and I'm a research professor in the Aquaculture and Stock Enhancement Program. And I focus on the sea vegetable, um, along with the green conch and the fighting conch. And since we don't see Paul, we don't see Susan, the other Susan. So Paul, go ahead, and then Susan just joined us again. You got to unmute Paul. Hello, my name is Paul Wills. I'm a research professor here at Harbor Branch. and uh, one of the researchers on the IMTA project. My primary focus is in uh, finfish, the fish component of the system, integration uh, through engineering and, and biological uh, integration of the systems. So. Paul's modest when he says he's one of the researchers. He's, he's the lead PI and he, he makes us all work really hard on this concept and he's done a wonderful job as you saw from the video, there's so many other scientists that he's brought into it, and that's not an easy thing to do. So Paul does a good job. Susan? Uh, introducing ourselves? Yeah. Um, I'm a associate research professor here at FAU Harbor Branch, and my focus is on uh, anything invertebrate. Uh, <laughs> both health, health aspects of invertebrates, um, how the environment affects health and reproduction, dietary studies. So wide ranging studies. And you already know me, I'm Dennis Hasak, but what you may not realize is that uh, when I first came here to Harbor Branch a long time ago, I was hired to do aquaculture of seaweeds. My task was to solve the world's energy, energy crisis. How'd we do? Okay, maybe not the way we thought it would be. It turns out that energy is a lot cheaper. But along the way, I learned how to grow seaweeds, and um, I grow them for all kinds of reasons. And again, once Paul got interested in this uh, concept, um, his leadership really got us all together, and um, it's been really good to work with everybody. So, you know, my job is to grow the plants. So, we'll take questions. All you got to do is type it in from the Q and A. So. If you don't know how to do that, most of you do because you've been here before, but otherwise go down to the bottom of your screen and where it says Q&A. So here's one from Jay. Jay is a regular participant uh, and he says, can the aquaculture industry work in concert, concert with natural fisheries? For example, the state of Maine relies heavily on its marine industries in addition to lobster as part of its economy. The shrimp fishery has been closed for the past seven years due to concerns about overfishing. Clams are obtained in the wild and oysters are farmed but on a small scale. So I think the question, and I think maybe everybody could take a shot at this um, if you wish, but I guess the idea is, you know, how does aquaculture really connect with fisheries? And that's a pretty open-ended question. So we probably got a lot of ways to answer it. Paul, you're our leader. Okay. so. Uh... There's actually a, multiple facets to the answer to this question. Uh, one, one of the, uh, the ways that fisheries, uh, natural fisheries and aquaculture can uh, work, interact together is in providing seafood. So there's, there is a demand on seafood, the demand is growing and the demand for seafood is uh, bounding way and above what natural fisheries can provide for, uh, for consumers. So in essence, production through aquaculture using sustainable uh, methods can fill the gap, not supplanting commercial fisheries, but allowing commercial fisheries to operate sustainably while still providing the seafood that uh, consumers are demanding. Uh, another way that aquaculture has uh, provided fisheries 
And this is a way that has been been uh, in uh, being done for much longer than in providing seafood is in providing uh, for stock enhancement, a concept we call stock enhancement, either in uh, restoration, supplemental fishery, supplementing fisheries through uh, providing young, uh, if for a fishery is impacted uh, in such a way that it's uh, sufficient, what we call recruitment is not occurring. Uh, or uh, I said restoration uh, and then um, when you have in inland waters, uh, aquaculture is used extensively for stocking nat uh, or man-made lakes and that sort of thing. So if you make a man-made lake for power cooling or some other uh, for uh, source in an inland area, oftentimes they're stocked with fishes in order to provide either a fishery, primarily for stock providing a fishery, but aquaculture is what is uh, the tool for providing the young fish that go into those those aspects. So yes, in many ways, aquaculture is, uh, is uh, synergistic with natural fisheries. And Susan, I know you work with industry on uh, multiple projects, but is there anything you wanna talk about in, in terms of how you, you know, interface research with the needs of industry and how that, how that works here at Harbor Branch and the aquaculture park? Um. You, we do have a bunch of industry, well, not a bunch, we have a handful of industry partners on campus. And um, we, we work with them, like you said, on projects, on research projects together to help answer questions uh, that are important to the industry, like how can we create a, a better diet, for instance, uh, in, in aquaculture. I, I think what we have to be aware of with fisheries and um, in aquaculture, is it? It's not necessarily a competition, as Paul mentioned. And uh, for instance, culturing bivalves, for instance, bottom culture with bivalves does not interfere with somebody going out and, and recreationally or commercial fishery fisheries in shore. So sometimes there's a, a an issue that uh, that arises with uh, with where an aquaculture uh, operation, I guess, is situated and how that, you know, can impact usually recreational rather than commercial fisheries. But um, yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's paying attention to industry and, um, you know, knowing what their concerns are and just assuring them that we're all in this together and it's not a competition. So Megan, you, you have been involved in uh, industry efforts a lot and also I wonder if you might want to talk about ACTIT and, and how, how that got going. That was one of the first things that you were involved with. And in many ways, ACTIT became kind of the model for, for us at Harbor Branch and Agriculture working more broadly and getting the technology transfer and all that stuff. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And thank you for this great question. We do a lot of community-based work and in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s, some of you might remember the net ban on commercial fishing. And so Harbor Branch was very much involved with retraining program. And we helped to establish a um, clam industry by retraining many of the fishers to be clam farmers. And so that was a very successful project. Um, it's still, um, the industry is still very, um, vital and it's still growing. And Susan is actually very much involved in that project um, and continues to work in the industry with the clam farmers. Um, but I also wanna give an example of a local project that I'm working on now. And I'm in Puerto Rico right now, working in a fishing association uh, with the fishers. We have established a queen conch aquaculture hatchery where we're doing restoration and the fishers are working with us. And so it's a perfect example of some of the earlier work that we did with the clam industry and, and the fishers there. And so a lot of my work over the years has been definitely community-based and working uh, right now, I'm working more in the Caribbean. But it's a great question. And, and as my colleagues have mentioned, it's really a, a synergy working with fisheries and aquaculture together. Thank you all. Uh, now we got a lot of questions that have come in. 
Um, and more of these are going to be targeted just to one person. So keep putting more questions in and we're going to get get through all of them, I think, today. Um, so Gary asked a question. He's interested in the control panel that was mentioned in the video. Is it off the shelf or proprietary? That's probably a question for Paul. All right, so I lost a lot of my questions because I my computer froze for a bit. So I, uh, but I did see that question right before my computer froze. Uh, so the, um, the control panel that we use, we, um, we built here at our branch using off the shelf components. So from a technical perspective, uh, it uses an, uses an off the shelf PLC, which means programmable logic controller. If you're asking this question, you probably know that, uh, but for the others, I'm gonna explain it. <laughs> and then uh, we can integrate into that programmable logic controller, various sensors, et cetera. And we wrote, wrote a program, uh, which is, you know, any engineer that uses this type of control system uh, could uh, control or can, could uh, do the programming. Uh, this type of system is used extensively for controlling uh, all sorts of industrial systems. So we've just, rather than basically building a black, black box system that you know would be difficult to replicate, we decided we wanted to go with essentially tools that are available, easily available to uh, any to any industry in particular. Uh, that way uh, it would be much more accessible to that community or to any community. Um, nowadays there are other types of uh, control systems that are available, uh, some of them using uh, platform and we're incorporating some sensor systems that use uh, these types of uh, single board computers that then talk to other components of the system using uh, platforms called Arduino or Raspberry Pi and that sort of thing. Uh, as uh, a lot of those are used as development systems and then we can build uh, systems off of that. But uh, for instance, um, in the video, Bing talked about, Bing Uyang, one of our uh, engineering uh, professors, he uh, talked about a biomass sensor system. Uh, that system uses light, light and cameras to, uh, and our AI, uh, AI uh, algorithms in order to measure how much biomass is in the algae systems. And those, those sorts of systems can be incorporated into the fish, et cetera, uh, very similarly. So we're looking at novel sensors, we're looking at off the shelf sensors. And then, uh, uh, like I said, the control system itself is PLC based. So this one is from Michael and I know Michael, he uh, used to work at the USDA, so he's a plant guy. Um, have you tried to introduce people to the uses of plant products as food by having cooking and tasting demonstrations? Well, I think this is a perfect question for Megan because in fact, tell us Megan, have you done that? Yeah, thank you for your question, Michael. Um, we've had a few uh, ocean entrees, uh, ocean science lectures. And so you can look back um, on uh, some of our past ones. And so we have done some cooking demonstrations with seaweeds and also with the halophyte plant. Um, so it has been a lot of fun introducing our ocean science lecture audience uh, to some of the things that we grow and to talking about sustainable seafood in general. Is there a tease? We might you consider returning, but we're gonna go live back in the auditorium. Uh, might you decide to come back and do another uh, cooking demo? And Michael, if you have never seen one, you really need to come. <laughs> Are you thinking about doing it? No pressure. Oh, I would be, yes, I'd be excited to do okay. that. And really uh, go online and just Google Harbor Branch Ocean Science Lectures and then look for Megan's name and you'll see several of them, they're really fun. Uh, Deborah has asked, do you sell everything you grow? Paul, you wanna address oh. that? So the system is a research system, so we don't sell anything. What we do is we produce uh, knowledge that we pass on to uh, others that want to grow and sell the, the products. But we've, we've done some cool things with giving some of, the, some of them away. Like I think, uh, tell, tell us about the food bank. So we had a project uh, early on, a uh, related project where we uh, produced a large amount of uh, Pompano as a demonstration project. 
uh, information from that fed uh, very much into the design and operations that we have of the IMTA system. And uh, at the end of that project, we ended up, we had, um, boy, somewhere around five, five to 7,000 pounds of pompano that we donated to a local food, uh, food uh, relief program. Uh, that was a wonderful experience. They worked with us in, in uh, getting the, the fish uh, processed and frozen so that they could then uh, uh, sell it, quote unquote, sell it in their, in their uh, food bank system. So really nice thing to really do. Wonderful. Okay, here's a question. Um, do you engage in any sweet water, in quotes, projects? For example, growing freshwater eels. That's kind of a fishy question, Paul. That's yours, I guess. So I'm going to assume by sweet water, they mean fresh water. I'm, I'm thinking that. And they asked yeah. specifically about freshwater eels. It's generally, uh, when I think of sweet water, I'm thinking of uh, freshwater systems rather than brackish or saltwater systems. And uh, we don't currently work with eels. Eels are very interesting is we do work with a, a related species called bonefish. And the bonefish work that we're doing uh, is aquaculture in support of determining the reproductive physiology and biology of the species to inform uh, management. So this actually goes back to the pre first question that I answered is that we can use aquaculture as a tool to determine biology of a species, which then can inform management decisions. That's what that project specifically does. So not producing animals to stock, but producing animals in order to understand their biology. Uh, bonefish actually have the same larval reproductive uh, stages as the eel. And uh, so that's the relevance there. They don't migrate into fresh water like the eels do. But uh, so the answer is no, but we, we do study species very closely related to the, the American eel. So a question from Michael, and I think this is probably gonna be for Susan. What is the state of shellfish restoration in the IRL system? Mm, that's kind of a loaded question because it's uh, usually a count, county driven projects um, but it's ongoing and um, I know we have some up and down the, the Treasure Coast, south of us, north of us. Um, there's, uh, it's typically oyster restoration, but there's also some interest um, a little bit further north looking at clam, hard clam restoration actually mm -hmm. uh, in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, basically centered from, um, there's a group, TN, the TNC, and there's a couple of groups um, associated with, uh, with the Whitney Lab and areas up there that are, are looking at uh, doing some hard clam restoration as well as oyster. But um, we currently, currently don't have anything going on here at Harbor Branch as far as restoration, although we have been involved in past restoration work uh, particularly south of here uh, in uh, Lake Worth Lagoon and monitoring things, um, oyster beds. Uh, and we've also been in, involved in a project a couple of years ago with um, FWC looking at the health of oyster reefs in the northern, mid, and southern, again, down to Jupiter Inlet, um, oyster, oyster beds in uh, those three areas and restored beds and the health of natural beds. So we've had some past uh, experience with that with different partners and agencies, usually count, county agencies or FWC. Currently nothing. Our county is really doing quite a lot with their- um, Oh their, yeah. They tax oh. themselves um, uh, half a cent sales tax. And so part of, part of the effort there is living shorelines and oysters are part of that. I have a very small project up in Satellite Beach. I'm, I'm a small part of a cast of many people, uh, including some of the people that Susan is referring to because there's some clam work going on and there's some moisture work. And what's incredible is that um, it looks like the seagrass work, the restoration is, is, is much more successful there because of the presence of the oysters. It's a physical thing. 
where it reduces um, actually access by larger grazers, which is a big problem up in Vard uh, when you're trying to restore seagrasses. So it's, it's really cool. Plus, I think increasingly you're starting to see kind of like IMTA, except it's not IMTA really, but you're trying, you're, a lot of times you're seeing restoration now where the different types of organisms are being commingled because there's some advantages to that, just like what we're seeing, you know, in our tank system. So we got a question from um, Clay and you all know, you all know, uh, all the speakers know Clay because Clay is a, uh, has, was a scientist here and still is an affiliate scientist here. He's up in Virginia right now. And he said, great integrated program all. So here's a question, probably for me. Are we seeing increasing consumption of sea veggies in Florida? Hi, Clay. I think that's such a great question because that's really why we want to get to. And I think we should start off thinking, well, how are we seeing an increased consumption of sea veggies in the United States? And the answer is yes, for the United States, we're seeing a lot more consumers um, understanding the value of seaweeds. Um, and then also there's an expansion of the sea vegetables, the, the marsh plants or the halophyte plants. And so I think it's part of the, um, education and that's that's part of our goal is to inform more uh, of the audience or, or, or potential consumers about the value of eating seaweed and also the sea vegetable and so I anticipate that in the future that we will see an increase in consumption of sea veggies in Florida and elsewhere in the United States. Cool so this one is from Deborah can any of the plants help the Indian River Goon regenerate food for the manatee. So I guess I could take this one. Two quick answers. One is um, that's one of the reasons we're doing seagrass restoration. And for the, those of you who heard the presentation last month about the manatee die off and how that's all due to a lack of seagrass due to the harmful algal blooms uh, that started you know, a decade ago. So um, that's gonna take some time for that to actually happen. And then ironically, um, while we were getting ready beforehand, we kind of go online a little bit earlier, make sure we're all connected. This actually came up and, and Paul mentioned this, that some, somebody had come by and he saw us harvesting the sea lettuce from the IMTA system. And the thought process was, could we maybe somehow use that to help the manatees? And I think I said something like, hmm, Paul, I think we need to think about that because that could be an interesting concept. You know, could we grow enough ulva uh, to really make a dent, so to speak? in it, um, probably not, but could we, could we start to work in that direction? And I would say probably yes. So I thought that was an interesting concept and it came up twice today, Paul. So I think third time's a charm. If somebody else brings it up, we're gonna do it. <laughs> okay, next is Nolan. Now Nolan also has history here and he comes a lot to the lectures. He was a intern in, uh, here for I think two years and has done well uh, in graduate school since then. I'm glad to see this group effort grow and succeed so much. I look forward to see how the HBO IMTA evolves in the future and how the rest of the world adopts these kinds of systems. What do you see as the main limitations to expanding the implementation of IMTA systems, not just the exact kind used at HBOI to worldwide use? So IMTA is a great concept. So why isn't it, why isn't it um, more in, in use right now? So good question, challenging answer. Who wants to take it? Paul. I'll start. I'll start and others can chime in with their opinions. Uh, so I think that one of the greatest challenges is, uh, and I, there's a group up in Canada that's extensively worked with IMTA in open ocean systems. They have, uh, they had a long-term project called SIMTAN, the Canadian Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture Network. And they had Canadian scientists that were working specifically on IMTA implementation around in and around uh, uh, open ocean net pens for production of salmon, uh, and that's one of the one of the implementations of this concept. Our implement our implementation of this concept is in land based recirculating systems, as you saw. But I think based on what I. Uh, heard and know from those scientists is one of the main impediments is uh, the consumer and 
educating the consumer on the uh, on the benefits of some of the less well-known products that would have to come out of the system. And uh, in particular, seaweeds. Most, most uh, Americans consumers, which would be uh, the largest uh, consumer set for IMTA growth in the US are unfamiliar with or have a cultural uh, negative opinion, even though it's not you know, it's probably opinion based on a lack of knowledge more than anything else of the products. Uh, and Megan can uh, talk, talk more about that. Um, but then the other piece is it's a, it's more complex system than most fish farms or most aquaculture farms are used to. Uh, just doing aquaculture of a single species is a very difficult task. And what we're talking about here in these systems is doing uh, multiple species that have very different cultural requirements and having to integrate them into a system. So this, you know, this is what this is what our task is: is to demonstrate and do the research that's required to show how to integrate these various uh, um, species. And you know, you see that we're very selective in the species that we choose and how we're implementing them. We we take a very much an ecological approach to look at each individual species and what their uh, what there's a term in ecology nowadays called ecological services. So what is their quote unquote ecological service in the system, and then how can that species then provide uh, value to a farmer? So these are. On the, on, the, on the surface, they are simple questions, but when you start looking at to the integration of the biology and the engineering required to provide the proper uh, environment for the various species to, to live and grow with the water being exchanged fully between all the components. Because remember, all the water mixes and, and is distributed. It, uh, the questions become uh, a bit difficult. Right now, Susan is working on an experiment looking at pH. pH is a critical issue in the in the system. You know, when you're trying to grow animals like fish that produce a lot of CO2 that lowers pH in the same system as you're trying to produce oysters and and uh, clams and uh, sea urchins that are very sensitive to low pH but need higher pHs. You know, how do you control that when the water is being exchanged so fully? So um, you know, it, these are the types of difficult questions that are, that have to be answered for, and uh, then we, the, you know, we're working on like this video as part of our technology transfer, getting people interested in the idea. So we, we need to get the information out there and have farms start to embrace the system. So, so we got a few more and I'm going to try to find one good question, maybe for each of us, if we can. Uh, so um, one quick question was, have you considered stocking the inner lagoon with grass, fish and oysters? I think we touched on that. Um, there is a lot of interest in that and probably the Indian River Lagoon National Estuarine Program um, is looking to really develop restoration centers um, for that effort. So I think that's something that's definitely going to be happening more and more and I'm sure we'll be involved. Um, let's see. Uh, this is for Susan on shrimp. Uh, from Gary, do they get enough nutrients from the bio flock, or do you have to supplement, feed them? You do have to supplement and feed them, uh, and we've done some research in the past with incorporating bio flock uh, or ova into shrimp diets to replace uh, the fish meal, or at least a proportion of the fish meal. But um, no, they need. It's a supplement or uh, an additive into the feed. Maybe your little babies could exist on the bioflock, okay, but as they get bigger, they're going to need a lot more nutrition than bioflock alone can provide. And here's one for Megan. Have you experimented with any salt tolerant freshwater vegetables? Okay, thanks for that. I'm going to answer both Gary and Deborah's question at the same time. Okay. So um, the salt tolerant, well, the halophytes that we work with, um, although they are salt loving plants, 
they actually can be grown in fresh water. Um, maybe not all the way fresh water, but definitely, um, definitely low salinity. So that's what we've been working with is um, mostly these salt tolerant plants. And Deborah and the rest of the audience that's, um, that's with us, I wanted to let you know that we've been working with um, two cooks and chefs. Uh, Andrew Zimmern um, had, was sent some of our, our sea vegetables recently. And so if you, any of you are on Instagram, um, you can follow um, Queen Cock 2020 and you'll find uh, some segments on that. And also Jennifer Bushman. So we're starting to get the word out and that's a great idea to uh, continue to work with cooks and chefs. All right, it seemed that we should have one more question and that should be a question for Gabby because Gabby was the one who put the video together. And the question goes something like this. So you got a lot on your plate for the coming year. Harbor Branch is gonna kind of reopen. We're gonna have some outreach opportunities and people can come back. What, what, what do you think, what do you see as kind of like the biggest uh, opportunity for people to come back and reconnect with us? I mean, do you see, it's probably a combination, but if you just wanna tell people, you know, here's what you should do, come, come January or, or sooner, what would you say? Well, that's a great question, Dennis. So, um, you know, this last year, you know, our team pivoted to virtual programming and we're really excited to be back at the visitor center and relaunch our in-person programs. And so we're excited to see all of you and we've made some exciting updates to our visitor center. We uh, used the closure to work on some renovations. And so we've got some new displays and um, new research that we're highlighting here. And then we're also increasing our tours. In the past, we only did tours once a week, uh, but when we resume our in-person activities, we'll be touring every day. So there are so many opportunities for you to come. And, and then of course, when we resume our boat tours, uh, that was a program that we launched just a few weeks before COVID. So uh, we're excited to really dive back into that. And um, a great thing for our programs is that we have many grant funded projects, like I said, science communication components of research grants, and then also educational grants. So this year is going to be, I think, our largest year for outreach, which is really exciting. Uh, and this is my five year anniversary in this role. So I'm, I'm kind of counting that as checking off <laughs> that box. <laughs> yeah. Well, who would have thought all these years? Well, anyway, thanks, Gabby, for putting this together. And thanks to all the other, my colleagues. It's always fun to get together. And um, I think we covered a lot of information. And I hope uh, everybody out there has a really good rest of the year. And again, if you can come back um, for in-person lectures, those will start in January. So thank you all. See you again.